So Omar, how's, uh, how's it going with Ramadan? It's good. My sleep schedule is officially uh, flipped. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just <Right>. waking up. <laughs> right. Yeah, because well. it's pretty late eating at night, huh? Yeah, yeah. So we're breaking fast at 8.08. Uh, 8.08, oh, eight. Eight, oh, eight, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, lots of adjustments we all have. I just got finished um, watching with my family uh, here our pre-recorded worship time. And uh, uh, it's, um, it's, it's touching, uh, but there's a lot of longing, I find, also, uh, that we really are missing uh, the personal interaction. And we're doing all sorts of things through video. Uh, people are sending in little videos to show how we're trying to communicate with one another. It's, it's pretty touching. That's yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, there was Paul Rasmussen had a piece in the Dallas Morning News today about how much, you know, meeting online misses in terms of the necessary human interaction of being in a worship space. And I think it's true. I mean, you cannot make up for that. And at the same time, it's given us an opportunity to focus on aspects of being a faith community that we typically don't pay as much attention to. Yeah, we're we're um we're enjoying this Ramadan. I mean, it's it's different, but it's it's beautiful in its own way. Um, we had a the one year anniversary of the Valley Ranch Islamic Center we just passed, so the the building of the new one. Congratulations! And so what we did was we we literally just had a car parade where we just passed out candy. We just told people to drive in, make their signs, congratulating VRIC on one year, and uh, we just passed you know gave people candy and dates. It was really beautiful. Um, so it, it was it was sad but beautiful so i think that's <laughs> that's been the theme you know it's it's been um different but but still um uh, we're finding a lot of joy in different ways so well it's 12 12 and so welcome to our weekly faith commons state of our faith conversation uh, we're delighted to be back with you thank you to all of you who have been tuning in weekly on facebook live and we have a very special guest today and a conversation uh, that I would like Rabbi Nancy Kasten to introduce for us. And she'll uh, move us around during this program today, but uh, we wanna thank you for sharing uh, in this. And if you would like to make comments on Facebook Live, uh, feel free to do that and uh, people can interact with one another and we'll get back to you if possible as well later. Nancy? Thanks. So um, we are so thrilled that uh, Dr. Brian Williams could be with us today. Dr. Williams is a trauma surgeon who was kind of thrust into the public spotlight when he treated the victims of the 2016 police shootings in downtown Dallas. And since then, he's become a physician activist focusing on the intersection of race, violence, and medicine. And in fact, he has his own podcast, which is just terrific. And I'll just give you a little plug for that right here while I'm uh, introducing you. Thank so you. Dr. Williams, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that when public policies limit exposure to a pathogen, the negative impact of that pathogen can be significantly reduced. But this science-based approach has not been applied to the epidemic of gun violence in our country. Even though the major medical associations as well as religious organizations representing majority denominations of all faiths have advocated for precisely this approach. On Friday, the Dallas Morning News reported that in the month of March, break-ins to homes and businesses declined dramatically while violent crime and the threat of, the, of domestic violence conflict and suicide significantly increased. At the same time, there was an astronomical surge in sales of firearms, many to first time buyers with no required license or training. How did this dynamic play itself out from your perspective as a physician and more specifically a trauma specialist? Did the flood of guns into homes make us safer? So when I talk about uh, the presence of firearms, I will 
talk about this with the, the public health lens and my experience as a trauma surgeon. So I will say unequivocally that gun violence has not decreased in my practice. I will also say anecdotally, it's possibly increased during that time. However, we still don't have all of our uh, up-to-date numbers to verify that. And as an academician, you know, I will demand to have some evidence before I make that bold statement. But certainly, we've not seen any decrease in uh, gun violence. And the, the, the explosion of firearm, sterns, firearm sales concerns me on a number of different levels. One is the interpersonal gun violence that I deal with uh, as part of my normal job, but also think about uh, you combine that with shelter in place. What does that mean for intimate partner violence? What does that mean for, for children that are there at home with these firearms? Because we know based on the evidence that with the presence of our firearm, the chances of a lethal interaction for intimate partner violence increases the chance of a woman dying by five times. Uh, there's state data that shows that 40% of children know where their firearms are in their house, even though their parents or guardians think they do not. So there's this discordance between what a firearm does in the home, this presence, and the safety of the people that, people that live there. So when I think about the explosion of firearms, I'm thinking about these other demographics beyond what we talk about on a day-to-day -day basis, which is interpersonal violence, but what that means for children and victims of inter intimate partner violence and how that will affect impact their safety. Uh, and there's an intersection there of, of a lot in regards to policy and identity and you know the second amendment, how that impacts. But for me, the end result is that people are still dying and be, getting injured from firearms in the midst of this pandemic when people are staying home. Brian, uh, the pandemic of coronavirus, uh, you have paired with the pandemic of gun violence and said that your challenge is a double because of that in emergency rooms and trauma centers and that sort of thing. The impact of that is both on the community and also on the healthcare provider. Just this week on Monday, we read in the New York Times of the New York emergency room uh, physician, uh, Dr. Lorna Breen, who committed suicide uh, having left her um, job in Manhattan out of uh, depression over uh, just this uh, terrible challenge that she felt and the burden she felt and uh, her family couldn't rescue her even at home. And, and so this is sort of revealing a good bit about the life of the healthcare provider and what's happening in their emotional life as well. So I wonder if two parts to this, can you talk about what that feels like to you, what you're seeing among your colleagues during this time? And then also, if you could speak to what you have also talked about as being the disproportionate effect of both of these pandemics on people of color, uh, especially in our communities. Well, when it comes to firearms and suicides, just remember that of the 40,000 deaths that occur each year from firearms, two thirds of those are resulted, result from suicide. So self-inflicted wounds result oh. in most of those firearm deaths. Two -thirds. And we talk about this physician, uh, there is this, uh, this, this discordance that somehow those of us in healthcare are immune to these issues of mental health that in, that impact the the greater uh, the rest of the society. So we too are human. We have these same doubts and concerns. Mm -hmm. And in a time of crisis like now, we have this sort of this rolling, continuous mass casualty from this infectious disease that is trying for a lot of physicians. So you add that to the knowledge that there is increasing concerns about physician burnout and healthcare worker burnout on top of this. Uh, we should not be surprised that there are healthcare workers that are also dealing with mental uh, health issues as of this pandemic. And when you consider that most farm related facilities result from suicides, we should also expect that it's quite possible that there will be healthcare workers that commit suicide by firearm. So what we should do is like, take a look at that and ask ourselves why this is happening 
it's not just happening to healthcare workers, but it's probably <laughs> happening across the country now with people that are staying at home and having to wrestle with their own mental health issues. So the potential for this increasing the uh, impact of farm related uh, self-inflicted wounds and fatalities is something we, we, we can't ignore. Now to your second part of your question, George, about how this disproportionately affects communities of color, uh, you know, gun violence is, it kind of runs rampant in segregated communities that are segregated based on race. Uh, half of the gun homicides every year are black men, uh, but it's under, underreported now. It's sort of expected that that's just the way our society is. We, it doesn't have to be that way. So half the firearm related uh, homicides are due, are impact communities of color. Now we talk about COVID and this infectious disease, this, there's this agent we can't eat, right? It's, it's microscopic. And we're having data come out from various communities of how black Americans are dying at a rate disproportionate to the general population. In, in Chicago, where I'm working, 70% of the deaths that have been reported have been African American when we make up 30% of the population. Louisiana, 70% of the deaths. Uh, St. Louis, I saw a report about a week ago that 100% of the deaths were Black Americans. Wow. And you're popping up across the country of similar disproportionate demographics of, of COVID-related deaths that are impacting Black. So that's part two. Now part three, George. <laughs> We, we're, this intersects with my day-to-day -day as someone who's yeah. dealing with gun violence, which is still going on. And I'm seeing how the resources of the hospital are impacted by COVID-related uh, infections and serious illness and death. And the resources that are needed for both are overlap. So the intensive care unit, the emergency room, sometimes the operating room. And uh, it's just disheartening for me as uh, a Black American to see so many black men coming in that are dying from gunshot wounds and now recognizing that so many black americans are also in the intensive care unit on life support trying to survive this disease so i step back and ask myself why is that what is it that contributes to both of these seemingly disparate uh, public health issues that results in this impact on the black community and there's things that we can, that can recognize in society is about income inequality and housing and education and healthcare inequality. These are things that don't just impact black Americans, they affect all of us, but they're affecting black Americans at a high rate now. So what can we do to address that in the future so that when the next crisis occurs, we don't live like we are now watching so many people die unnecessarily. Thank you for that, um, Ryan. And, and um, I think that's a very powerful note that you just, uh, left us off with at, at the tail end of that answer, which is that there are in, inequities that spur both the disproportionate uh, victimization of black men in COVID-19 and with gun violence. And, uh, you know, being from Louisiana, my wife was born in a hospital, Earl K. Long Hospital in Baton Rouge that's now destroyed. And you have to think about the inequities of the types of healthcare centers that are present usually in the places where people are going to go in and the different, difference between a private hospital and a public hospital and the disproportionality in care that might be given to the victims, uh, how quickly we give up on someone uh, and so many different things. And I wanna kind of expand on that and ask you from your experience, seeing this from these multiple perspectives, uh, from your vantage point, how do hospital resources and emergency rooms have to expand now uh, to treat gun violence? Uh, you mentioned the burden that it's putting, that gun violence is putting on the intensive care unit. So what is, you know, we're hearing about hospitals overwhelmed right now because of COVID-19 and, and potentially getting worse. What is the burden that gun violence is putting on healthcare resources at the time of COVID-19? And do you foresee a change now that the weather is getting nicer and, you know, the shelter in place is getting, uh, is relaxed? So in our trauma group and uh, talking to my colleagues across the country, we've all been very committed to Make, ensuring that there is no diminish in the quality of trauma care as a result of the pandemic, because the pandemic will certainly stress hospitals, hospital systems, community hospital systems. So what do we do to ensure that trauma, which is episodic, it's uncontrollable? How do we ensure that 
our trauma care does not diminish during that time. And also recognize that trauma surgeons are also board certified in intensive care. So they are a unique resource in that they can operate, they can take care of these traumatic injuries, but they can also be in the intensive care unit caring for COVID patients that are on life support. And we're doing that all, all across the country. But you wanna protect that resource, the human resource, just the surgeons, but also the nurses and the techs that can do all these things to ensure that as the resources are stressed with an influx of COVID patients, that you can still provide the, the trauma care. So what we've done is to minimize what we do as far as the, the, the COVID treatment and, and allow our pulmonary critical care specialists and our anesthesia critical care specialists to, to deal with that until they actually need us because the system is overwhelmed and they need more of us in the ICU. Now, fortunately, we've seen collective uh, progress based on the community adhering to shelter in place and doing physical distancing that our initial projections are not as bad as we expected. What we're experiencing is not as bad as our initial projections, which is a good thing, uh, but it's still, we're still stressed, but we're still meeting our capacity. Hmm. So the lesson there is that you, these simple interventions, just staying at home, washing your hands, avoiding contact, has had a tremendous impact and allowed us to maintain our readiness as a, as a trauma division and still provide care for everyone in the community that needs care for, uh, for, for COVID. Now, as the weather gets nicer, I mean, there's, there's this you know, urban legend within trauma that in the summer, traumas go up and violence increases. Uh, I, I will say that I've noticed that gun violence is a year round phenomenon and uh, we, we stay pretty busy the entire, the entire year. I'm less concerned about the nice weather and more concerned about the relaxation of shelter in place orders that are occurring right now. I think that'll be a bigger burden to the healthcare system than the nice weather. Mm. You know, um, Dr. Williams, we all belong to um, faith communities that have been advocating for shelter in place and we've been limiting our meetings and gatherings um, in order to take the pressure off the healthcare system and keep individuals healthy and safe. And um, of course that's come with some, um, you know, big losses as well. And we're not able to meet the needs of everyone. But again, most of us have been following those rules and supporting them and doing everything we can to advocate for those, um, you know, actions, some communities of faith have not. And they have said, you know what, it's more important to meet in person. Maybe the spiritual needs of people are more important than the physical needs. And likewise with um, gun violence, you know, again, most of our denominations, mainstream denominations in the United States have come out in favor of um, addressing the issue of gun violence through uh, common sense laws that keep people safe and healthy. And yet some uh, religious communities advocate for uh, arming oneself, bringing one's weapon into uh, their places of worship. And again, um, think that it's the most important thing that they can, they can um, take care of their own safety and they're the only ones who can. So, um, I wonder, George, maybe you could speak a little bit to those communities and, and how they um, think about the issue of gun violence and how that corresponds to their idea of their faith. Well, thank you, Nancy, for the question. And I think, you know, you, you're tossing it to me because the truth of the matter is most of those faith communities are Christian communities. Uh, we, we don't see the same level of uh, defensive rights for guns and worship from uh, either the Jewish or Muslim communities or Although other communities I will of just faith. Say, I will say that this week we had a great example of how the Jewish community in Brooklyn just came out for a funeral. So it right. wasn't the gun violence issue, but it was, um, you know, right. putting those priorities first at the expense of public health. Right, and, and I think we still need to maintain that even in the Christian community, this is not the dominant voice of Christians in the country. This is a voice that is uh, being 
um, recognized in the media, uh, but still is a minority point of view, generally speaking. There's the vast majority of Christians are uh, abiding by uh, the uh, restrictions uh, across the country and are loving their neighbor by uh, refusing to gather during this time. Uh, but the, the, the larger question is also First Amendment right to worship, Second Amendment right to own guns and, and, and the like. And there is a consistency among some Christians about that, that it's about my rights. Uh, I, I think it's important for us, and, and I'm really challenging the Christian community at this point to think about this. And that is, there's, there's very little in our Christian faith that you can find in our Christian scriptures and in tradition that would uh, be in the spirit of Jesus, that would say the first principles of life have to do with my rights. Uh, instead, it has to do with doing right and doing right in response to my neighbor. So rather than letting even the Bill of Rights, which we celebrate as Americans, and uh, recognize as a check on the government's uh, tyranny and uh, on uh, power over communities and individuals. Uh, nonetheless, our primary driver in our values and decision-making is not what is possible for us that we can claim, but what is beneficial for us and for our community that we look after our neighbor. And if that means sacrificing some of our rights to protect ourselves in order to protect our neighbor, then that's where I think our, our, uh, our spirit ought to lead us in, in this process. Uh, but let me uh, move Brian toward that question about the relationship of the faith community toward science and scientists and doctors and the like. Uh, Einstein said that science without religion is lame but religion without science is blind. So my question to you for us uh, is, what do you think is important for faith communities and individuals of faith uh, at this time, when there seems to be a tension between us and the science and the data? How would you urge us to look at science and scientists uh, during this time so that we can have a more constructive relationship? Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting uh, the topic to discuss, George, because we talk about faith as this people have their faith, but the, the reality is that's strongly within their identity, right? Ah. So we start talking about faith, you're, you're questioning their identity. Mm -hmm. And the same tr is true for gun ownership for many people. That is part of their identity. It's not about just a right to own a gun. It's like, this is this is part of who I am. So when you start to have science challenge someone's identity, that can uh, lead to, wow. to conflict. But I will say that when scientists and academicians talk about what's best for public health, and we, we use data and research and experience, it's not to say that your identity is, is wrong or to somehow diminish who you are. It's just looking at the greater good. And there are many scientists out there that do this work that does not conflict with their faith. They, they, they were able to, to integrate both those into who they are and to the, into their identity to do their job and still be true to their faith. So what I will say is that, yes, I, I, I recognize how important this is for an individual's identity. And I recognize the need to or the, you know, the inherent visceral reaction to protect your identity in the face of anything that seems like a challenge, particularly when it's scientists who you don't know that are speaking in terms that you are not familiar with. But, but recognize when we talk about what we can do as far as reducing COVID-related deaths or gun-related deaths, it is not about saying that you are a bad person because you think this way. It is about, yes, I recognize your inherent worth. I recognize your identity, but please, add this in addition to that, that we're trying to do what's best for society as a whole. If your faith is about doing right by your neighbor, if your right desire to own a gun is about keeping people safe, then recognize that scientists are trying to do the exact same thing. We're just using different words and different weapons to do so.
I've been really inspired by some of the ways that faith communities have been engaging in that um, acknowledgement of identity. Uh, we have a colleague, uh, Deanna Hollis, who was ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA to be the gun violence prevention uh, minister. And she serves the entire denomination, which is the largest Presbyterian denomination in the United States. And she really spends a lot of time fostering conversation about this issue and helping people get underneath to what, what's so important about gun ownership to them. And that is important because, you know, you think about there are, there are efforts like do not stand idly by that tries to work with gun manufacturers to make those guns safer with, you know, locks and identifiers and things like that, or safe lock where, you know, you can get a free lock for your gun um, cabinet or whatever. You know, we have that in that program in Texas, but um, people don't know about it. People think that once you say anything about, you know, controlling uh, safety or access or limiting any aspect of gun um, ownership and access is somehow a violation. And in fact, you know, I think most of us would call that idolatry in the religious community. Yes, I mean, from my perspective, I was actually thinking about this idea of God's decree. And last week when we spoke about God's decree, we spoke about it from the perspective of doing the best that we can to prevent harm um, and taking the proper means that we have in order to not perpetuate bad situations and to cause harm to ourselves or to the public. There is also another element of belief in God's decree and predestination or, or God's decree in that nothing, you know, th that a person who believes in God's control and God's power uh, should also uh, be comforted as much as they can to the point that they don't start to act irrationally and do things that would cause harm to themselves or others in the sense of uh, taking the means as idols besides gods, right? And so that's why the guns could become idols, right? It's, it could be, you know, this is what's going to protect me right now. And so that's another element of faith that we have to challenge our communities with and challenge ourselves with first and foremost, that look, if we say God's in control and we're in, we are entrusted with certain blessings of God and to not make things worse. We also have to yield to God's providence and say that, you know, I'm comforted by the fact that I know that he's in control. I know that he has power and I trust that power. And I'm not going to try to, uh, or, or I'm not going to panic and act irrationally to try to take things in my own hands in a way that would be destructive, right? That's where faith soothes and comforts. And I think gives us the level headedness that's needed to be able to balance this all out properly. But Omar, can you say a few words about how that that faith and comfort in Islam is not in uh, opposition to science and to medicine and to those who help us, uh, but it is it's it's compatible. I know that many people really probably are not aware of the rich history in Islam of of the flourishing of the sciences and Averonus and 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 the the creation of Arabic numerals for heaven's sake and right. you know the, the I, I think uh, there is a, a, a real regard and great historic contributions from Islam uh, that people aren't aware of. Correct. So in Islam, it is it's a history of civilization because Islam encouraged the use of medicine and the discoveries of medicine and science and coffee. You know, which I think is medicine. <laughs> Coming from a fasting person right now, I mean, coffee is, is medicine right now for me. So Islam obviously has a rich history of encouraging that. And that's, that goes back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, encouraging people to look for medicine. And by the way, even when it comes to things of, of, uh, of, of mental health and, uh, and emotional uh, healing and cures, um, this idea of boiling barley in water. And uh, what that produces of serotonin, I'm, I'm going to stay in my lane, doc. I'm not going to act <laughs> like a doctor here. But uh, there's a history of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, saying that, you know, uh, encouraging prophetic medicine himself and like how we, how we cure ourselves and heal ourselves. And I think that uh, surely science is encouraged in Islam. It is, uh, it, it's part of uh, honoring God's, uh, God's blessing upon us. The first word in the Quran that was revealed was read read right so read educate yourself that's the first word is read and so we're trying to read you know and, and i think um reading and and developing our our capacities is important 
and the only point that I was I was making is that once you've done everything that you possibly could do, mm-hmm. at that point you find comfort and faith and say, now it's in God's hands. I've done my part. I've 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 gone to the maximum extent within rational and healthy means to protect myself and protect my community. Now it's in God's hands, and I'm comfortable with what with what comes out of this at this point. Brian, as we come to a close, I, I want to express on behalf of uh, all of us at Faith Commons our gratitude for you in all that you have meant to our community here in Dallas and now in Chicago. Uh, you were uh, important, as Nancy said, uh, after the shootings um, with um, caring for those uh, in, in the trauma center uh, there um, at Parkland. And, and, and then you, you also became concerned enough that you were appointed by the mayor uh, to lead the community uh, police review board and led it to a, um, a reinvention that gave it actually some teeth. Uh, and uh, now there is an investigator and oversight to police uh, in, uh, in matters of gun violence. And because of, uh, uh, of your concern, it, it went beyond the emergency room, went beyond the surgery room. Uh, and and continues now through your podcast and through uh, work like this. I know you're consulting with Clay Jennings, uh, Clay, Clay Jenkins, right now, uh, at uh, for for Dallas County. So thank you for all that you've yeah. meant to Dallas and continue to do in advocacy about medicine, race, and violence. No, thank you for thank you for having me, George. And I, I will say that, uh, especially with the police review board. The community did so much work before I arrived. I just helped them get across the finish line at the end. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so Dallas is always in my heart. It's in my blood now. You can't take it out of me. Terrific. <laughs> Dr. Williams, is there anything else as we close that you would like to say about um, what you might hope for from the faith community to help you be able to um, treat and heal from your perspective as a trauma surgeon? I've been extremely impressed by the faith leaders in Dallas and Chicago. They've taken a proactive and leadership role in educating the communities about the the dangers of COVID and what they can do to protect themselves, like really give them actionable uh, steps they can take to protect themselves in their communities. And I found that 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 was done without much prodding. So I would say keep doing what you're doing because I think outside of the, the policymakers and outside of the, the healthcare workers, the, the faith leaders are an extremely important part of what we can do to keep uh, the public safe and healthy throughout this pandemic. Wonderful. Well, uh, if you would allow, I'd like to uh, offer a prayer on your behalf, Brian, and uh, those uh, who work with you and in healthcare and, and for all of us during this time. Shall we pray? Good and loving God, we give you thanks that we all believe that you are deeply present with us in this time. That you feel the suffering and loss of life uh, and connection that people are feeling. We ask you to give us strength, to encourage us, to chase away the despair and to replace it with hope. We thank you for the leadership of people like Dr. Brian Williams, all of those in the healthcare field, uh, those who are on the front lines. We ask you to give them endurance, uh, help them to sustain their strength, to keep their faith, to continue with their keen mind and loving care of their patients. And dear God, We pray that you would continue to inspire the faith community to cooperate with those in medicine and science and politics and all of these uh, so that we can promote the well-being of our communities and honor you in whatever our vocation is. And so now give us wisdom as we go forward into this week. Uh, We pray for our communities and ask your blessings upon them and your protection in your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week on the State of Our Faith. Thank you.